These paddocks on the edge of the South Australian outback may look vibrant with new growth now, but Gareth Scholes knows not to take this lush scene for granted. And it was a bit of a baptism of fire into farming for me when I first uh, started going out and farming on my own. Um, we had uh, three of the worst droughts, some of the worst droughts my father had ever seen in a row um, in 2006, 7 and 8. Gareth is a third generation farmer. He and his wife Rowan run a farm near the town of Minipa in the west of South Australia's Eyre Peninsula. Despite averaging less than 350 millimetres of rain a year, this region churns out roughly 10% of the state's total wheat and barley production. And a decent soaking rain, right when it's needed, can spell the difference between a bad year and a good one. This year was quite dry during April and, and May, and, and now very wet during June. The wettest that I can remember, um, proper winter rain <laughs> that I haven't seen since I was a kid. <laughs> Everyone has a go at the Bureau of Meteorology for getting the rainfall wrong, but you, you can't predict it. There's so many times where your neighbour will get twice as much rainfall as you and in a particular rain, and that rain might be the one that comes at the right time. We're driving along the Air Highway towards the town of Woodna. Now, if you can imagine the Air Peninsula as kind of like a really big shark's tooth with Port Lincoln right down the pointy end, we're driving along the gum line and this part of the air highway runs parallel to Goiter's line. Goiter's line was drawn back in 1865 by then Surveyor General George Goiter. It became the boundary between safe cropping land to the south and unreliable cropping land to the north. And for the most part, it's held up pretty well in the 150 years or so since, although it's possible for farmers such as Gareth to grow crops well north of the line in parts. In the past decade, the CSIRO and South Australian Research and Development Institute have more closely mapped the state's cropping margin. And if the climate becomes drier, that margin may shift south in the coming decades, and it could become harder to grow profitable crops in the region. I always remember the time that um, we had a huge dust storm as a little kid and the sky went dark. The older kids of the school told us that it was the end of the world and we believed them, yeah, <laughs> but we've lived on since then. Eleanor Scholes grew up in Minipa and has been mayor of the district since 2013. She knows how hard life can be on these drier fringes of cropping country. Just uh, three or four weeks ago, we were facing those really bad dust storms, high winds, dry area, and then amazingly, um, the rains start coming in within a couple of weeks. Um, yeah, everything just starts to turn green and grows. So water has always been um, a high priority in our areas, even going back to the days of the early settlers um, that recognised the value of our granite outcrops and the building of the stone walls around the edges of the rocks. That was their main source of water collection and once the rail was built, people had to wait for rail cars to come through mm -hmm. with water supplies. They would come in and line up to get their allocation of water. And even today, across Air Peninsula, water is a major issue. To make the most of the rain that does fall, some farmers in the region are involved in research to keep that water in the soil. Like Bruce Heddle, whose property is just south of Minipa, and he's been involved in research for decades. Well, it's pretty hard to envisage technological change unless it's being validated in the field. Yeah, it just, it just adds to the bank of knowledge, I guess, um, and it's interesting. Yeah, yeah so we're, we're standing alongside of the transmitter and the weather station for our soil mo one of our soil moisture probes. This paddock is part of a, a group of fields on Air Peninsula that are being intensively monitored to try and optimise the outcomes from the whole range of technologies and measuring capabilities that have come about in the last 15 or 20 years and try and put them together in a package that we can hopefully create more resilience and generate more profit from. Yeah. September or October, what will this look like? Hopefully it'll look like a two-ton canola crop. Chest high and all yellow, that would be my hope. And then there are farmers who are looking to use the land to farm something entirely different. Certainly the Air Peninsula has well-known immense wind resources uh, along the west coast and on the higher ground. 
and we're a very sunny place so we have more days of sunshine certainly than rain uh, and so it has a really good solar uh, capability as well. It's interesting that we produce energy uh, currently off of our land but we do it in the form of food so it's human energy, human food but it still takes the sun and the wind and the rain to produce that. And we have a lot of latent energy that falls on our land every day and nothing happens with it. So potentially this is a way that we can look at capturing some of that. Instead of feeding that solar and wind power into the grid, Tim Scholes envisions it powering the production of green hydrogen and green ammonia. Green ammonia, like normal ammonia, can end up as ammonium sulphate, ammonium nitrate, um, urea, aqueous ammonia and hydrous ammonia. If you remove the carbon out of the, out of the process, then all those products become zero carbon fertilisers, except for urea, which has some carbon uh, attached. Despite this local focus on renewables and zero carbon farming, a survey conducted last year found that less than half of full-time farmers on the Eyre Peninsula agreed that climate change poses a risk to the region. This finding echoes the 2021 Australia Talk survey, which tells us people in rural areas are generally less likely than those elsewhere to think climate change is a serious problem that needs to be urgently addressed. So it's not a matter of pitching climate change against the old ways. It's really saying uh, there are new economics happening here and the world has decided, rightly or wrongly, um, that it wants a low carbon future and certainly needs to. We're always working around our climate and, and we're constantly adapting to that and if we can, uh, even if the cl climate's remaining the same, if we can utilise our resources like water better, um, we can uh, uh, be more productive anyways. And um, would you like Reuben or Amelia to take over when you're ready to hang up your boots? Yeah, like definitely. <laughs> definitely, I'd always uh, like to um, get the second, next generation to come through and, and, and teach them and um, yeah, I think there's a bright future in agriculture and technologies and everything can, seem to be keeping us ahead of, ahead of all our outside influences um, as, we, as we keep going along.